Good morning, and um, apologies for the slow start following a party that ended up in a rather carnage, I believe, until four o'clock in the morning. Um, we, um, <coughs> we would like to thank you that you're turning up so early to attend uh, the first ever done um, um, OCT course that we, uh, the Leicester OCT course, we named it when we started it back in 2014 in Leicester. Uh, UK with uh, Irene Godlob, who is not here with us today. She's a professor in ophthalmology and pediatrics, um, Irene, and uh, a very a lovely person to work with. And we have worked closely over the years. And uh, since uh, we have this amazing um, uh, connection with uh, Paris and uh, ophthalmica, and uh, Greece is uh, my home place, Thessaloniki is my hometown. We, we thought to organize this in Thessaloniki, uh, but this is, where we, uh, <coughs> this is where we live, and this is uh, some parts of Leicester. Uh, I would like to uh, share with you. Um, Leicester is north of London, and um, you, you have... Um, you have... Quite, uh, this is the National Space Center, believe it or not, it's based in Leicester. And um, this is the market stool where you find sometimes Greek fruits coming over. Uh, Gary Lineker's, the footballer's uh, family, has a stool there. <laughs> and um, this is, uh, the, the Midlands are very strong in rugby as well, and this is the, uh, the rugby, apart from football that you will see in a while. This is the rugby stadium. This is a lovely theatre called the Curve Theatre, and this is the main square of Leicester. Um, and Leicester became quite a bit, apart from obviously our research, <laughs> quite big on the map of football with, the, uh, with a guy who didn't do very well in Greece, but we openly welcomed him in, in the UK. And in Leicester, you know, Ranieri. And in Leicester, we got the uh, Premier League. Um, in um, 2016. So it was a very good year. A lot of us attended quite a lot of football games. Uh, so in Leicester, we were running this course, um, and, and that's other uh, parts of Leicester that has a very uh, vibrant Indian community. And this is the Diwali festival. The festival is a big Indian festival, uh, the Festival of Light. But I think I... I uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, coming back to the uh, uh, OCT, uh, which, as we all know and we all say in conferences, this has completely changed the way we contact modern ophthalmology and modern daily ophthalmology clinical practice. And we owe a lot to James Fujimoto, who is this, uh, the guy you see there on the left-hand side, which in the middle 1990s uh, at the MIT developed uh, the... Um, concept of OCT and is applied in many other um, medical specialties, not only in ophthalmology, but it's in uh, dermatology, cardiology. But in ophthalmology, it was very crucial and made a massive impact, as we all know. Basically, what to take away from the very complicated, maybe we can say, way of uh, the complicated way is more so in the in the fact of the so computer software, but the, <coughs> the 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 equipment itself works with light, so sends light, and the light comes back, and depending on the delays going through various layers of the retina, you have what we'll see in a while the different layers of the retina. I will, I will explain you in detail. That's the very basic sim uh, principle of the OCT. So it's something that works like the ultrasound walls. Instead of sound, we send a light. That's a very good way to start understanding about the OCT function. And as you will see here, we evolved, as you all know, from uh, some very basic uh, OCT equipments uh, a lot of you, and more so the uh, a little bit older ophthalmologists, you remember the Stratus, the time domain. That was the first generation of CT. Uh, the Stratus of CT that came around in 2005, 2006, from Zeiss into the market. And the picture on top is the analysis that uh, the software and the OCT was providing uh, back then, or 
sorry, was uh, back then. So this is the analysis of the uh, time domain of CT, but with changes in the um, in the way that uh, the mirror inside the machine reflects the light, we developed the spectral domain of CT where you get a much clearer picture of your scans. The images are a lot more clear. And that's quite important because as we do now with the angio CT and all the uh, trials and all the understanding we're developing in the angio CT, back then, we based our research and our studies and our reading on the time domain and spectral domain later of CT. One fundamental way to describe an OCT is to use a very important word called hyperreflexity. So there are some structures here that they're very hyperreflective, so they're reflecting and higher, so this coming in orange and green, and there's some hypo-reflective, so they're not green, orange, they're darker. And a very big dark area, darker than green and orange, is, is, is the outer nuclear layer where the photoreceptors lie. So by understanding the hyperreflective and the hypo-reflective OCT uh, you know, <coughs> uh, differentiation, you know where exactly you are in the retina. And it uh, becomes quite important even for the inner retina or the other retina. For instance, one can say which eye this is. Is this a right or a left eye? You see there the nevrofab layer here on the right-hand side, so this is the right eye. And it's becoming quite important. In my early times of reading OCTs, I was more fascinated into the ISOS, <coughs> which, is, which is a smaller orange layer here and the RPE, and the, this greenish is the external limiting membrane, this greenish line here. So there's a lot of things you can take away by seeing as, you know, the normal, you have to start for the normal, obviously, the normal OCT. <coughs> and it helps you greatly, after you understand the normal OCT, to study the abnormal OCTs, and we'll see quite a few of these in a while. So we had the development of uh, the equipment, which is uh, from time domain to spectral domain to spectros or CT, and that <coughs> gave you a little bit more details uh, deeper in the retina and the outer parts of the retina, as we will see in some more um, images here. So you have a much better understanding of seeing the choroid. And also you see sometimes uh, parts of this, this is a, so the patient had posterior vitreous detachment over here, and this is a macular hole, obviously. So you see a lot more details deeper with a swept source of CT, which takes up to 100,000 scans uh, per, per second. So it um, uh, gives you a lot more deeper details. And these are different equipments. And from developing the spectral and swept source, we, we wanted to go away from the static kind of, uh, uh, static kind of scanning to a much more, uh, more dynamic one, but also 3D in different layers. Because with the OCT scan, you see one, one certain area. And a lot of people tried, hundreds of companies have tried uh, to develop different types of OCTs, some of them very unsuccessfully. Um, they knew that they have to follow uh, a Doppler a kind of blood flow um, um, uh, technique to be able to um, see more things in the retina, especially in pathological conditions such as macular degeneration, um, and, and other retina conditions. And then the, that was the thinking, and I remember we had discussions with Irene, even when we got a very specific OCT, I will tell you in a while, which is a handheld OCT. And she was telling me, that was back in 2011, uh, that um, we, there were a lot of companies back then even trying to use Doppler technique to implement it into the OCT. And that's Irene.
So we, in 2011 in Leicester, we purchased the handheld OCT is what you see. And uh, as I said, the Irene is doing pediatrics and is used uh, in scanning uh, uh, retinas uh, of eyes that we haven't scanned ever before. Because a baby of a few weeks cannot stand on an OCT machine, as you can imagine. And we were never before, we were never able to scan a retina of a human who is just a few days or a few weeks. And that was, uh, that was pioneering. <coughs> I have personally used this. This is exactly the machine we purchased for 400 or 450,000 as a part of a grant. That was a PhD uh, project as well. And I have used it. Uh, it doesn't have a very difficult learning curve. Uh, you can use it very, very easily. It actually Im impresses me how quickly you can scan. It's very, it's very uh, user friendly, um, uh, and you can move it so you can take it to theater. You can, uh, and this is the team. And uh, in the trials, where we have involved controls of kids. Even I know my kids were involved in the trials as well, because you have to have normal controls. And and we. <coughs> we got some amusing information about how the retina looks like in various conditions, in very early stages of, uh, in very early stages of uh, the human life, like in albinism, which is a very different OCT of hyper and hyporeflective areas, uh, in achromatopsia. And all this work has been published extensively. But I, uh, that's very detailed. It is not the, on the scope of today's um, uh, today's talks. Um, so the angio OCT is the latest OCT um, that we are using in our clinical practices. It hasn't been widely used in the big uh, clinics that we do, the MD clinics, when you have a hundred patients uh, every day, isn't it, James? You don't use it in Newcastle as daily clinical practice, do you? No, all the time. No. Yeah, how we, how, we, how we use the OCTA is all our big uh, patients, you know, the big uh, volume of patients goes through the spectral domain. And uh, later during the day, you will be able to see cases where the OCTA is useful. So in cases where the diagnosis is, uh, is needed and whether we can avoid the angiogram, you can see where, how we can use the OCTA. And that will be later today. Um, so how it works when what it does, it uh, displays vessels of retina and choroid without contrast. And um, the common method currently used uh, is the, the correlation um, in, various, in various phases. Uh, so the correlation of light signal uh, due to passing blood cells so basically, it catches the blood cells, the blood flow, and you can see that uh, in, in, a, in a certain color on your scan. And yes, and there is plenty of uh, information one can get. So up there, you've got a, on the right hand side, you've got the uh, spectral domain OCT, and here you have how the OCT and the OCT is looking like. And it is important sometimes, uh, as an example here in um, AMD, when you have a retinal pigment epithelium detachment with supposedly no activation, although these hypo-reflective areas, the darker areas, are suspicious for subretinal fluid. But on some occasions, if you don't have them, you can see, you can r refer to the angio CT and see whether you have activity there in the form of, and this has been the discussion now about how you clinically value that. And also gives you um, additional information. So another fibrovascular PED with subretinal fluid and uh, the, uh, the membrane here in AMD. You get a little bit of additional uh, information in, um, you've got the macular edema in diabetes, in a diabetic patient, and you get all sorts of information uh, about ischemia, about different layers in 3D, 
And that's a talk, extensive talk that uh, James will do in a while. And also monitors the results of the injection. So you can scan your patients after doing an anti vegf injection and see the activity of the membrane in different weeks. And uh, you see an OCT with no leakage and no activity because if it's no subretinal fluid, then you would assume there is no activity of the disease, there is no VEGF line there. Uh, and then you refer to the angio to see whether actually there is any activity. I have a case to present you uh, because OCT is not only useful in um, uh, wet MD, but also it's, it's very useful in dry MD as well. And this is, uh, this is a lady we, um, uh, we wanted to operate for a cataract operation. And uh, because the vision was uh, not satisfactory for her. And she had quite nucleosclerotic cataracts in both eyes. And she had um, dry MD. And I want to use this case, uh, first of all, to, uh, because it's a little bit interesting case, but also to tell you a little bit about the OCT in the dry MD, where you see a quite extensive high periflective area. And so this is a dry MD. And, uh, you know, uh, because we, we've seen the hyperreflectivity inside in the inner retina, I would like to demonstrate how the atrophy looks like as well. And uh, we did the, um, uh, so she has geographic atrophy in the right eye, this lady. We did the cataract operation and we scanned the eye again and vision dropped in a matter of probably it was three or four months quite remarkably. With, that was one case that we were quite uh, concerned about whether we should have done the cataract operation in the first place or we should have probably be a little bit more reserved as uh, there is, <coughs> there is a, a talk overall about whether you do cataract operation in geographic atrophy. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the AMD uh, phenotypes um, and we have um, a lot to, uh, we, we own a lot to those two people uh, on the screen. Uh, this is Don Gass uh, in medical retina and Lawrence Januzzi, um, who they have extensively done work in, um, uh, in uh, medical retina and they have named uh, all sorts of different diseases. Some of them I will uh, present in a while. Um, and I will start with a, uh, with a uh, type of, uh, it goes into the bigger spectrum of AMD, uh, but all these things are rather debatable, you know, um, of uh, polypoid choroidal vasculopathy, for short PCV, which was noticed in America in black women and was named gumen uvel syndrome. And uh, the, the, the lesions are better identified on the ICG, but OCT is extremely helpful. And that's why I'm sharing some scans of OCT in PCV with you. Um, usually the lesions are in the mid periphery, around the posterior pole, around the arcades, around the optic disc, they can be everywhere. And they're usually in clusters of more than one or two. And they're surrounded by exudation that sometimes takes this form of a, of a ring of exudation, which is called circinate exudation. And the OCTs have a rather, uh, this is one of my patients after injections. So you see this is the exudation, like a ring around the optic disc of a PCV on treatment with anti VEGF agents. And this is the ICG, and it's an ICG because the optic disc is dark in the right eye. And usually the polyps have this kind of uh, dome-shaped uh, appearance. Uh, and and this is the BNB, the feeding uh, vessel. And uh, more polyps, and this is a clinical picture as well. They come in clusters, dome-shaped. And we do see some ex excavation afterwards sometimes, or before or after. And you see these hyperreflective spots. Uh, and, and again, you know, there are a lot of findings still on the OCT where we debate what they are. And I remember, 
uh, when I want to learn a little bit more about OCT, so I went to the people that knew more about OCT, like Gabriel Koskas in Paris. So I personally asked him, you know, these hyperreflective spots, what are they? Are they exudates or are they uh, white cells or whatever? And he said, depending on how quickly they go away. <laughs> so if they go away very quickly are white blood cells. If they stay there forever, it can be exudates. So still to the day, we debate things. So it's not everything that... Yes. Um, so, and this is... Uh, a diagnosis of two very characteristic uh, features of phenotypes of um, um, AMD. So this is wet AMD, clear-cut wet AMD. And when a patient like this comes to our clinics in the UK, I personally don't do an angiogram. I straight immediately consent them for uh, treatment. And I believe that's probably a practice that is uh, adjusted uh, worldwide. Uh, and primarily we do that because we have lots of patients and massive capacity issues and uh, we're very familiar with the use of OCT and the clinical condition of the diseases and we do treat immediately because even if we had the angiogram probably we, will, uh, we would uh, treat anyway. Uh, it's always good though to have an angiogram because it gives you a lot of information when you run into issues. So although we don't do it, I recommend everyone who comes has probably both angiogram and ICT. And these are two different types of uh, AMD. <coughs> I'm sorry, apologies with this. Uh, um, and you see how differently the PEDs look like um, and how differently the angiograms look like. And on the right-hand side is a retinal angiomatous proliferation stage 3. And here is a PCV. And you can tell that just even from the, from the OCT. Uh, so the retinal angiomatous proliferation is uh, in the spectrum of the wet AMD. The name came from Lawrence Januzzi. And <coughs> he developed this idea that uh, um, the neovascularization starts from the inner retina, from inside the retina in stage one, and then progresses and enlarges and reaches a point when it breaks the RPE and goes under the RPE, if lived untreated. And uh, this is a stage, it's very difficult to capture a stage one, uh, stage one wrap, um, because obviously it's very small and it doesn't give any clinical signs. So the patient, and rarely our patients come into the clinics with clinical problems, the majority of them, go to a routine optometrist test, 89% of them, where suddenly they discover there's something wrong with the eye, but they don't know what it is, and they come to our clinics. So in stage one, it's very difficult to um, catch the wrap and have it on the scan, but you can possibly see it clinically as a small dot hemorrhage uh, in uh, the posterior pole where it can be symmetric. So when you check one eye, check the other eye as well, as we sent those couple of days of, the, of uh, this uh, really, uh, really good quality conference. So check the other eye of the, uh, for, and usually they come symmetric, you know, in, even in the, in the same kind of area. So what will differentiate stage one from stage two, as you've seen in the previous screen, is whether the neurovascularization penetrates, starts to penetrate the RPE. So you see how important it is to know the layers of the retina on the scan. So if you know that goes be below the orange line, so it penetrates underneath, so you go to a different staging. Um, clinically, how much that helps? Maybe it gives you a little bit of a feeling of how, how difficult this disease, you know, how, how severe this, this problem is you have to deal with. Um, and perhaps again, that might lead to advising the patient accordingly. And this is a stage three, as you've seen earlier. So I've used similar scans, so it gives you a little bit of understanding. So it goes underneath and causes um, a massive serious PEDs. So when, when this is hyperreflective, so it's, it's dark, we call it primarily serious PED. When it's hyperreflective, we call it fibrovascular. As well. 
And, uh, and very interesting, uh, you have all these phenotypes and you treat your patient, and suddenly a patient comes and presents quite unhappy with vision, and that's because there is a, a, a quite devastating complication of this disease called a tear of the RPE when the RPE breaks and causes usually comes with, with a quite extensive hemorrhage, sometimes like this. Uh, it's not very common. Uh, we did look into this because very early on I had a, a fellow who ran into uh, a few issues with one of the patients who developed a tear, and he was extremely unhappy with the outcome of treatment. And uh, luckily, it's not very common. It's about 5 to 10 percent of those patients on treatment that they develop the tear. We don't know the exact mechanism. Mechanical uh, restrictions and uh, you know, mechanical forces probably play a role early on in the treatment. And, but we've noticed, we've done a very thorough um, review in our clinics of more than 6,000 injections. And we, we had quite a large number of tears, which we studied very carefully. And we have published that. And what we discovered, uh, among other things, and it was for the very first time, was that we've noticed that the majority of those patients were elderly patients, where the RP was also compromised. You know, it wasn't as healthy and strong, probably, as it was in younger patients. <laughs> the, the tears were happening reasonably early in the treatment. And the majority of them uh, had the tear just after the three injections, three to seven, eight injections. In terms of the prognosis, the most important thing is location, location, location. When the tear is going to happen, when the break is going to happen. We had a happy patient, and we published that as well, who um, had count and fingers vision because of a posterior capsular opacification. And we did the YAG laser, and he developed a tear probably even after, a little bit after the YAG laser. And he could see 612 with a massive tear. But the reason I'm saying this is the location. The tear was so far away from the fovea, so the patient was delighted. I think he even brought us a cake. So, <laughs> so the, location, the location of the tear is very, uh, we treat the tears, as uh, we mentioned, and, and um, uh, progressively, they get worse, unfortunately, and they develop fibrosis. I don't have too many more slides. Um, that's a good response of treatment. So that happens when we treat. So the, uh, the good response of when we treat. And lastly, uh, I would like to share another very interesting finding. Um, when, you, um, when you look into the scans of patients with wet MD, but other conditions as well, such as the pattern macular dystrophies, you can see that as well, called outer retinal tubulation. That's been described here uh, for, it's been described by Spade for the last six, seven years. And uh, this is the, you might, you might think that this is subretinal fluid, but it's actually a sign of a very chronic disease when it is developed. Um, when we started looking at it, um, obviously, uh, when you have a patient with a scan, and before we understood this pathology, we'd say probably you have to do an injection. So it's active disease, is fluid there. But then with Spade and his publications, we understood that this is actually a sign of chronicity of the disease. There is no active disease. There is no VEGF to treat and we didn't do anything about it. And our American colleagues, and I was most impressed about it, I remember at the uh, 2014 ARVO, I woke up one morning to go to an AMD phenotype meeting, and I was most impressed that not only were uh, seeing the arteriotinal tubulations carefully, but they had a histology staging of the arteriotinal tubulations on the rosettes and how they look like, and they're very detailed. And they went as far as to do dissections of, uh, I remember it was, uh, in the study, it was about 24 eyes. So that's another future of the, um, of the OCTs in patients with uh, wet MD, that you can see these arteriotinal tubulations, these circular findings. But also we can see them in pattern dystrophies, in generally in areas where the uh, RP becomes damaged and atrophic, and the above photoreceptors develop these rosettes. You know, they, they react to their death this way, in a sense we can say. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Hakis. Uh, certainly, we're becoming better and better in uh, getting to know when to start uh, injections. Uh, we don't have much data of uh, when to stop, and the outer retinal tubulation, certainly in my hands at least, uh, in on my list, is a sign to stop injecting because there won't be much benefit after uh, they develop these findings. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? <coughs> I think I kept the time pretty good, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, 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 you did very well. I mean, shall we proceed with the next talk? Okay, very good, yeah, thank you. I've adjusted things. Mm -hmm.